All right, chem students, today we're going to start our thermochemistry unit. You need to have your blue notes packet. We're going to cover pages one and two. Thermochemistry is the study of heat changes that occur during chemical reactions and physical changes of state. So we're going to show you, as a reaction progresses, what happens in terms of heat transfer, as well as what happens when we go from gas to liquid, liquid to solid, or solid to gas. Now our first diagram I'd want you to draw in your notes packet in the space provided is that of a firework. Now this is an exothermic process, meaning heat is going to flow from our system to the surroundings. Our firework in this is going to be our system in this case, and the energy that is released is going to be going into the surroundings, this time the atmosphere. Okay, our next example is an endothermic process. Heat is going to flow from the surroundings to the system. We have a cold pack, which is our system, and it is going to absorb energy from the surroundings, in this case an injured ankle. Now for practice, we have a person sitting by a campfire. If the person sitting by the campfire is the system, is this system exothermic or endothermic? This would be endothermic. The person is absorbing the heat from his surroundings. Another example, we have a person that is sweating profusely. If he is the system, is he exothermic or endothermic? In this case, he is exothermic. He is releasing heat, causing the perspiration to absorb that heat, and then it evaporates away from him to cool him down. Okay, collision theory is an important part of what makes reactions happen. In order for atoms and ions and molecules to react, they need to collide in a way that has enough kinetic energy to start the reaction. Particles lacking the enough kinetic energy will kind of bounce apart when they collide instead of actually reacting. So we have a beaker here with our reactants and as they re bounce around they hit the right spot and the reaction can take place. Eventually they've all reacted and we have nothing but products left. Now, not all collisions will result in a chemical reaction. They have to be at the right angle and they have to have enough energy. So when everything is working, it works perfectly. But in this case, here in the middle, they just don't have enough kinetic energy to get past that barrier to make the reaction happen. And in this last case, they just don't line up right and they just bounce apart. Now, the next thing we're going to cover are energy diagrams. The minimum amount of energy that particles must have in order to react is called activation energy. Think of activation energy as a barrier that reactants must cross in order to be converted to our products. Uh, a great example is the diagram. The person pushing the boulder up the part of the hill, he's got to get it to the top of the hill before it'll roll the rest of the way down on its own. So he's going to do a little bit of the work to get it started, and then the rest will be on its own. Now, the other thing we want to talk about is the activated complex. This is the name for the arrangement of atoms at the peak of the activation energy barrier, kind of like at the top of the hill. It's an in-between state, being neither reactants nor products, our reactants have basically broken all the bonds and are ready to be reassembled. Our activated complex is kind of at the top of the hill and then it'll proceed down and make products. Okay, our first energy diagram is for an endothermic reaction. In an endothermic reaction, the reactants have less potential energy than the products. The change in H, the change in energy, is positive. Energy must be supplied, meaning absorbed by the reactants, to raise the particles up to the higher energy level. So we are going to start low, and we are going to, as we add our activation energy, 
we're going to break all the bonds holding the reactants together. That will get us to the top here with our activated complex. Our activated complex is now ready to form new bonds to create the products. Now the products that are made have kept a lot of that energy so our overall reaction is positive. It goes up. So our change in H is going to be a positive number. So all of these things mean that we started with a low level of potential energy, we had a larger amount of activation energy, and then our products kept a lot of that energy in the bonds that they formed. So we didn't lose a lot of heat or a lot of energy as we made our products. So energy that was absorbed is greater than the energy that was released. Now, our other example is an exothermic reaction. The reactants have more potential energy than the products. Our overall change in H is negative. The extra energy is going to be released to the surroundings. Now, we are starting at a higher potential energy level, but we're still going to break our bonds to get to our activated complex. As we start forming new bonds, we release much more energy this time and the overall reaction is going to decline. We are going to end up at a lower level than we started with, which means our change in H this time is a negative number. This means that our energy absorbed was less than our energy released. We release much more energy for an exothermic reaction. Alright, the last thing we need to talk about is heat energy units. The calorie is a commonly used unit for heat energy. Now energy contained in the foods we eat is actually measured in kilocalories or calories with a capital C. Now for example, one Oreo contains 55 kilocalories or 55 calories with a capital C. Now 1000 calories is the same as a kilocalorie or in this case a calorie with the capital C again. Now, Fortunately, in our calculations, we're going to use the joule because the joule is the SI unit for heat energy. We have 4.18 joules is the same as one calorie, and 1,000 joules is the same as one kilojoule. That'll do it for today's lesson. Make sure you do the homework packet pages one through three.